Good morning, everyone. I guess it's I guess it's about time to begin our class. So, right. Be uh, before we get started. Uh, is there a volunteer who would like to carry the microphone around to people who have a comment? Mm -hmm. need, need someone who's fast and can get around the auditorium quickly. Anybody willing to volunteer to do that? Carry the microphone around? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Well, we're going to continue our class in Second Corinthians that I've titled Paul Opens His Heart to the Corinthians. Uh, last week, we ended in chapter 7 with uh, around verse 11 and Paul had been uh, talking to them about the letter he had written earlier and this letter had uh, had hurt them and had caused them sorrow and he kind of regretted that uh, he had to get after them on certain topics but he was happy that their sorrow had led to repentance and uh, and uh, he talked about godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. And they had a godly sorrow which led them to repent and want to, to do better. Uh, <clears throat> part of this uh, class today is going to be on the topic of giving. Uh, Paul, uh, Paul spends about two chapters talking to the Corinthians about their participation in giving. And uh, so, as of my background, I chose this picture of Roman coins. I thought that would be appropriate. Maybe one of these coins was actually in that collection. You never know. So let's start with uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 7 and verse 12. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all, by all this we are encouraged. Um, most scholars think that Paul was referring to the incident in Corinth where a man had his father's wife and, uh, and that was the issue that caused the most um, sorrow and anxiety in the church at that time. He had actually told them to kick this guy out of the church until he repented. And uh, that's what they ended up doing. And it had a happy ending. We read earlier in 2 Corinthians that this man did repent and Paul told them to forgive him and accept him back into their fellowship. Um, one of the things that I noticed where he says it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party. Uh, for some reason, it had never occurred to me before that the man's father was still living. But, but that makes his sin all the worse if his father was still living and this man was living with his father's wife. So that was a, an egregious sin that he was committing. But he said it wasn't on, on account of those two men that he had written the letter, but rather that before God, you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. So I'd like to discuss a little bit. What was Paul's major concern when he wrote to the Corinthians about the man who had his father's wife? It was, yes, Jim. Accepting that behavior and not actually condoning it. 
yeah, they weren't, they weren't upset about it. They weren't, uh, they were allowing it to happen without saying anything. And uh, it, that's kind of a tendency we all have, isn't it? That we don't want to make waves and we don't want to hurt people's feelings. Yeah, I, I said something about caring enough to confront and doing so uh, with love. Right. But, but Paul's major concern is for the church, that they're tolerating this, and, and that's what he's, he's uh, talking to them about. Was, was Paul not concerned about the individuals involved in this sin? Yeah, he was, he was concerned about that, and he wanted the man to repent. But, but he said something about yeast uh, back in 1 in, uh, Corinthians. How does yeast um, apply to this situation? Okay, it doesn't take much. What does yeast do in dough? Yeah, it spreads. And he's, he's worried that if they tolerate this sin in the church, that it's, it's going to spread. It's going to, other people are going to see it and say, well, he, he's doing it, so I can do it. Yes, Ben? It goes to that saying of one bad apple spoils the bushel. It okay. Does, it just takes one rotten thing, and all of a sudden all of them become rotten real quick because what's infecting one will affect everyone else if you keep it in there. Yes, it's, it's a danger in a church if you tolerate sin and let it, and let it continue. And, and so even though it seems kind of harsh to withdraw fellowship from this man, uh, it, it was for the greater good of the church and, and also for the good of the man who was involved. And, and we see that it had the desired effect Okay, um, let's continue in verse 13, the second half of the verse. In addition to our own encouragement, we were especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit had been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you was all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad I, have, I can have complete confidence in you. What, um, what was it that made Paul and Titus so happy about their reception of Titus. What were they what were they happy about? Dick? They were expecting to hear the good about uh, Titus and Titus. I will say it again. They were expecting to be rebuked by Titus when he came. Uh, they dreaded it uh, because they expected something worse. It turned out to be a blessing. Okay. And, and what was Titus happy about? He was well received. Yeah, he was well received. He, he remembers their obedience and that they received him with fear and trembling. Uh, have any of you ever received a minister into the congregation with fear and trembling? That's, that's not something that we're used to doing. What, what does that mean? Why did they receive him with fear and trembling? Respect. respect. They had respect. Uh, Titus was a minister who was working with Paul the Apostle. And... Uh, And why, why was that a good thing? 
but they received Titus with fear and trembling. They're happy. To, oh, Ben. I was going to say, it's even more than that. I, I think I, when I see this situation, I see Peter seeing Jesus, and Jesus showed disappointment in Peter, knowing what Peter was going to do anyway when he betrayed him, told somebody three times, oh, I don't know this man. Mm -hmm. people, people, we have a dread of when we do something to a friend or to a family, <coughs> and now we have to go and face them and not knowing what to expect. And I think that's how the church felt when they were had Titus coming is because they really didn't know. They were expecting one thing, and they, in order to make sure that it try to at least not have it happen, they made a change for mm -hmm. the better. It would have been worse if they had made no change at all or made a change for the worse. You know? Okay. So they, they were afraid kind of of the reception. Uh, Logan? They were afraid kind of of the reception that they were going to get from Titus or the reaction they were going to get from Titus. But you have to have respect. You have to care about what that person says before, before it affects you that way. Logan? Go ahead, Logan. I also believe that they feared God because you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? They lied to the Holy Spirit and they died. Okay. God is not a wimp. I okay. mean, when bad things happen, he can do to us worse than we could ever think somebody rebuking us could do. Okay. Yeah, it's... It involves a fear of God, and they, they have to believe that Titus and Paul were representatives of God. And so so that's, that's where they're getting this respect and fear and trembling. Bob? Well, back here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in part, um, Paul said to the audience, for I resolved to know nothing while, let's see, where did I start off here? <clears throat> I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest in man's wisdom, but in God's powerful power. So Paul is trying to uh, preach the gospel by his way of living and teaching to make sure that he was not misleading pe people because he certainly didn't want to have God's frown upon him, but it turned out that uh, this is something that, that helped him to be more pleasing to God. Okay. All right. Well, let's look at a couple of scriptures that that talk about this respect that we should have for God's ambassadors. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 16, uh, this is the occasion when Jesus sent out the 72 to uh, evangelize in the towns around there. And one of the things he said to them was that he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me but he who rejects me rejects him who sent me so when when Christ sends out an ambassador and you reject him you're rejecting Christ and when you're rejecting Christ you're also rejecting God that that's what's causing the fear among these people and then in Ephesians 2 19 through 20. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So these apostles that Jesus chose are the foundation of the church. And we have to have a deep respect for them. 
Um, and, and today in the church and in uh, theological seminaries and Christian colleges even, people are not respecting the apostles but are, are saying that, uh, that they're just men and that the things they wrote were just the opinions of men, not necessarily true. Uh, Dix told me about his experience at San Francisco Theological Seminary where his teachers didn't believe that Paul or, or the other apostles were inspired. And uh, they, they just thought that they were writing their own opinions. And, and one time Dick asked his teacher, if you, if you don't believe this is true, why do you spend your life teaching it? And, and what was his answer? It makes a good story. It makes a good story. So <laughs> it's just kind of sad. So even in some of our churches here in Portland area, uh, they're rejecting the, the authority of the apostles. And that's something that, that we have to make sure we don't do, that, that we need to respect them and what they say is true. And also Hebrews 13, 7, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. We're even instructed to obey our elders, and uh, we know that our elders, I know personally that elders are uh, fallible and weak in many ways, but, um, but we need to, he says that we need to obey them. Does this mean that our church leaders uh, can't be wrong in what they say? No, it doesn't mean that. So, so how, do we, how do we handle a situation when a church leader is in the wrong? Yes. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to add something to it. I think that God in his wisdom and, and our brotherhood has followed the pattern established a, a eldership as a plurality because men are fallible and sometimes they can be wrong I know I've found myself that way a few times <laughs> but I, you know in the plurality there is a less likelihood of one person's mistake affecting the whole church and uh, often uh, I, I see you know God's hand in that process he keeps us um, somewhere near the middle, I guess I might say, because of that uh, plurality. And then the other thing I think that is uh, uh, significant is that all of those elders are married <laughs> and they have wives to inform them uh, because uh, the women represent usually better than 50% of the congregation and elders need that information uh, to understand that, that uh, demographic yeah, even though elders are human and fallible, uh, it's still God's plan for the church, and and we, and we need to uh, respect that. But how do we handle it when an elder is wrong? Ben, I'm going to say that we have to do as it was said in there. God is holding them account accountable for knowing the truth. We need to hold the eldership accountable for knowing the truth. If they're not in the truth, we need to help in love correct them and say and show how much importance it is to base our lives on a Bible standard and a God standard rather than a human standard. And our accountability is based on our responsibility. The elders are there shown as being highly responsible accountable for mm -hmm. what happens not only with the church but in their lives it's a respect thing okay and you touched on it but how how is it that we know what they are saying is wrong yeah we we compare it to the scriptures we go back to the apostles teaching yes Lou I was just going to say that um, if you 
if you think there's a question, you go to them with a Bible in hand and say, why do you think this way? And let them answer through the Bible. Okay. When Paul was in Berea, the, what did they do that was so noble? Yeah, they, they checked out Paul's teaching, and Paul's an apostle. And uh, so, so if, if it's noble to check out Paul and make sure what he's saying is true, it's, we sure need to do that with our own readers. Yes, Phil? <clears throat> I think you, you say it right, that they, the Bereans were a good example. You know, they sought out the scriptures to see if these things were true. You know, it, they didn't just have a checklist of things from a distance that they could say yes or no to. They actually devoted themselves to deep spiritual uh, exploration again and again and again to see if these things were true. And I think... You know, rather than just firing off from the hip, you know, some accusation or something like that, it behooves us to spend a lot of time in Scripture because the Scripture is the place where truth comes, comes forth mm -hmm. again and again and again. I mean, over a lifetime, you can read it once and it has some truth. Then you read it 20 years later and it has more truth the same passage that you read before. And then you read it 20 years after that and it even has more truth. You began to connect things. So it's, that's the place where we need to be. Mm -hmm. Devoted to seeking God's, God's presence in our life. And, and don't, you know, we can pray and that's, that's a good thing. The scriptures are, have been kind of delivered to us, handed to us, and it behooves me to spend as much time as I possibly can reading and, well, thinking about it, meditating on it, so that those truths kind of percolate up. <clears throat> yeah, Jesus said that his church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ. So this, these scriptures are the foundation that we build our lives on. If anyone claims that part of this is untrue and that they know that it's something that's more true, then what they're actually claiming is that they have an authority that's above the authority of the apostles. And when someone does that, ask them, well, what's what are you basing that on? What's your source of authority that is higher than the apostles and the scriptures? Dick? And to protect the elders against false charges or something that somebody is uh, trumped up to uh, get even with a, an offense of some kind, <clears throat> the charge has to be uh, established at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Uh, a single person alone is not enough to establish a, a charge in the New mm -hmm. Testament time, and it should be the same today. Right. So if there need to be witnesses, there need to be people who are willing to stand up and say, that, that's not right. And yes, Lou? I did a gospel presentation with a, a Jewish rabbi, mm -hmm. and it is the gospel presentation was done uh, by one of my mentors and I gave him 27 verses and he got up and stormed out of the room slamming the door saying there's no no, no um, where you have no condemnation and he came back two weeks later and he said, you going to church tomorrow? I said, yeah. He said, well, I want to go. And he talked to the preacher, and he was baptized in Christ. Wow. Okay? And 
When he came back, went out to lunch, and I said, what just happened? He said, well, he, those 27 verses, because I give him the, the book, I give him a, with the 27 verses in it. Mm -hmm. He said, I went to the Old Testament, and the Old Testament proved that the Christ was the Messiah through your 27 verses. Mm. So it's just not reading the New Testament. It's reading the Old Testament. When, when, the, uh, when they wrote um, the New Testament, <clears throat> you can take the, what, what, saying, what Christ was saying and go to the Old Testament and see it. It's there. So yeah. that's why people say the Old Testament is for your learning. And it's a life learning too. I've, I've got 2,000 2, journals on passages from the Old Testament and the New Testament that saved my life. Mm. So that's how God changed my life, by reading the Bible. And that's if right. you're not reading it every day, as he said, you're not going to get it. Because I yep. must have read this one passage a hundred times in my life. Love others as you love yourself. And then one day I said, well, I don't even love me. I don't even like who I am. Mm -hmm. So I had to change that before I cha started changing other things. So read the Bible, I mean, in every day, because it is... God's word to us. That's right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the scriptures are powerful. Well, let's let's move on to chapter eight of Second Corinthians. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So he starts this section of, about giving with the, the example of the Macedonian churches. And first of all, uh, they were, they were ur urgently pleading to be allowed to be part of this service to the saints. Well, what, first of all, what was this servant's service to the saints that they wanted to participate in? <clears throat> Any of you remember? Ben? If I remember right, this is uh, the giving to Paul so he could take it to Jerusalem because they were suffering so bad. And okay. the churches in that area, including Antioch, had gathered money to take back so that they could help the Jewish people that were Christians in Jerusalem and in that area. Okay. So there was poverty among the church in Jerusalem. Let's look at a few background verses that talk about that. Acts 11, 27 through 30. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the, to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Okay, this, this happened before uh, Paul and Barnabas even went on their first missionary journey. So, so there was poverty 
in Jerusalem for quite a while going on. And in Romans chapter 15, he writes, Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there, for Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution to, for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So in 2 Corinthians, we, we're going to see Paul uh, uh, trying to encourage the, second, or the Corinthian church to share in this ministry to the poor in Jerusalem. And in, and in Romans, we see that he's on his way with the gift and said that the church uh, in Achaia and Macedonia had uh, sent this gift. So, so apparently Romans was written a little bit after 2 Corinthians, and he's actually on his way to Jerusalem with the gift. Well, he starts uh, with this uh, description of the church in Macedonia and, uh, and their desire to help. Why was Paul impressed with the generosity of the Macedonian churches? What impressed him about it? Tom? Tom? Yeah. Right, right there, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, they're, they're thinking of their service to the Lord above their own needs. Um, okay. Yeah, they earnestly desired to do this. It said, in fact, that they earnestly pleaded to be allowed. Why would they need to plead with Paul? What, why would they need to plead with him to be allowed to be a part of this? Jim? Uh, ben? Okay. Yeah, Paul, Paul is saying that they're poor people, and, uh, and he didn't want them to give away the little that they had and, and uh, suffer. In fact, further down in this passage, we're going to see that he wants equality. He doesn't want people to give so much that, that, that they're helping this other group while they themselves are starving. Um, so, so they were so poor and they were suffering so much that Paul probably didn't think that they should be giving it, but they, they pressed him, said, yes, we want to be part of this. And, and that's uh, very, very admirable that, that they would do that. Uh, did I see another hand? Oh, Ben? Hmm. I kind of relate this to Jesus when he was at the temple and all these people were pouring money in and pouring money in and pouring money in and the widow went up with two mites. She gave everything she had. She wouldn't have anything, but she trusted in the Lord to make sure that she got what she needed, but she was still willing to give out of her poverty. And that's kind of what the Macedonians are doing, is saying, we know God provides us. Mm -hmm. No matter how little we have, he will make sure we, we have enough, but we need to make sure we also care about everyone else 
let's make sure everyone else has enough. We're providing that need because God inspires us to do it. And that's what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is be inspired, not just because you may be rich, but because you care about those that are in need. That's right. Yeah, I like your comparison to the widow who gave her last two coins. Um, that's kind of what they were doing. They were, they were poverty stricken, yet they were help, willing to help others. That's, that's inspiring. Okay, let's uh, read a couple more verses. We have about eight minutes. 2 Corinthians 8, 6 through 7. So we urge Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Um, why did uh, Paul tell the Corinthians this story of the Macedonians when he's trying to encourage them to, to be generous? I guess it's kind of obvious, isn't it? He's, he's trying to sh show them. I think, from what I understand, the church at Corinth was a much more affluent um, they had more money. It was a city of trade. And, and uh, so he's telling them the story of, of this poor church, these poor churches up in the north that are giving this money out of their poverty, probably trying to make them feel a little guilty and, and uh, put a little pressure on them to, to participate in this. And... And I, th I think that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we need to have inspiring examples to look at. Ben? I think it's even more than that. I think there was a reputation. The Bereans started this by going and saying, it's not enough to just hear someone speak it. I'm going to learn it. And I wanted to say this before. That's why we consider the word a living thing of, the word is Christ. It's alive. It goes farther beyond what we can actually get out of it. And what Paul is trying to point out here is the Macedonians had that kind of wish to be a follower of Christ in that way of giving even beyond what they thought they could give. And Paul said, hey, these people showed by their reputation, knowing that they're in poverty, you should take that kind of grace, that willingness to go beyond. It's not about money. It's about dedication to God. It's about dedication to God's body. Okay. okay. Well, I think Logan has a comment. Oh, Bob. Thank you, why uh, the commendable giving is, is not because one of the the people were giving themselves to the Lord, but they saw the blessings of God that outweighed all their poverty. And so in their hearts, they, they knew good and well that uh, they were not losing because of the right attitude about giving and what is most important in life. Okay. And, and so they weren't giving in a wrong way, you know, giving the way that became something that was wide, widespread and therefore they could glorify God, and he had all reason to do so, uh, God did bring supernatural help to, to people that trusted him. Thank you, Bob. And then, Logan, did you have a comment? Okay. Well, uh, oh, yes, Jim. Lewis talked about how important it is to know the Old Testament, and I'm, I don't know this for sure, but I wonder if they reflected on the time that Elijah was sent to Seraphath and Sidon and uh, found a widow lady gathering sticks and asked her what was going on. And she says, I'm gathering a few sticks to go prepare a meal so my son and I can then die. Uh, 
she was, God knew her situation mm -hmm. and sent the great prophet Elijah out to save this poor widow and her son. And maybe these people were impressed by the fact that God takes care of his own. And so they relied on that. Yeah, that widow gave, she fed Elijah, didn't she, with the last of her food, and she was greatly blessed. Yes. Old, Old Testament passages in Psalm 22, 25, where David says, I will pay my alms among those who call upon the name of the Lord. And <clears throat> he's probably projecting the words of Christ, because that's the same psalm that says they pierced my side, you know, they, they gambled for my clothing, you know, they gather around me like dogs, you know, all those things that come out of Psalm 22. So it may be that Christ did the same. He longed to pay his alms or his vows, but he longed to do it in the place where those people called upon the name of the Lord. I see the Macedonians doing the same thing. <clears throat> Why do you have a bunch of people just get together and say, let's try to help somebody? But they were a one mind and they were willing to sacrifice even in their poverty to do this thing. Um, it was a gathering of those who call upon the name of the Lord who, mm -hmm. who accomplished this. Yes. Well, he gives this example of the Macedonians, and that, that's enough to motivate you, but he, he also gives them another example that we'll close on that's even more powerful. I am not commanding you, but I want to test your, the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. So that's referring back to the Macedonians. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So, so here's the ultimate example of giving. Christ, although he was rich, became poor. How did, how did Christ become poor? Okay. He was in heaven. He had everything, and he gave he gave that up. To be with the lowly human beings, the sheep. <laughs> uh, you know, we we can can't I, imagine I, what uh, a lowering of oneself that yeah. would be. Yes. Can I give a small tirade? Okay. There are different churches that talk about evangelism and they start with families. Okay? I know that's the best people to get here. Mm -hmm. But Corinth, the people in Portland have the same attitude that with Corinth. They had to change. I mean, they had a temple where, where they had prostitutes as, that every man could go to, married or not. And yet, we don't look at taking the, the mission field of the, of the people on the street, because it is a mission field. And once we start helping people that are destitute, we will see people that are upper mobile saying, boy, they're doing something different. And mm -hmm. maybe they want to join what we're doing. Yeah. So. Uh, all all it, souls are just as important as every other soul. Thank you. And Dick, we'll, we'll end here. You get the final word. <laughs> I noticed the last two scriptures you had on the board used the word grace. Mm -hmm. 
when we give sacrificially on behalf of others, we represent God, who is a God of grace and mercy, and also Jesus Christ in the same way, because giving until it hurts, until it feels good, is an act of grace and mercy on our part as God and Jesus Christ has demonstrated to us. That's right. Well, thank you for all of your comments. And uh, next week, Debbie and I are celebrating our anniversary, so we're going to be out of town. And Gene Waldrop, the handsome young man carrying the microphone around, is going to <laughs> is going to teach. So, so thank you very much. <laughs>